All right, thanks, John. Um, uh, thank you all for coming. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I'm really privileged to be here um, and share with you some of the work that we've all been doing um, down in Houston. So I just started a lab down there. Uh, this is after some research that we did at University of Pennsylvania. Um, our lab, we call it the Microphysiological Systems Engineering and Advanced Materials Laboratory, but um, all you really want to think about it, we're trying to study the structure of living tissue. So what is the structure that's found in the body? How does tissue grow? How do cells function in that environment? And how can we make that? And the story is about how we're trying to unify things that we're doing in the science community and the engineering community with all the stuff, the amazing stuff you're seeing here today in the maker community. And I think it's really great to have this event here. It's uh, part of a worldwide movement. There's people all over the world working with these types of equipment that you see here. And this really helps create a standard that we can all follow. So when we're trying to understand the structure of living tissue, this is pretty complicated. This goes all the way back to um, Leonardo da Vinci, you can see on the left. This is a 500-year-old drawing of the structure of the lung. And you can see the interdigitating branches of the lung vasculature and the lung airways. And even today, we still don't have a complete way to understand how tissue is structured and how it functions. And so you can look at things like micro CT scanning. You can do a CAT scan of a, of a person and extract out the architecture there. You can do things like uh, solvent casting to understand the structure of the airways, and you can look at fluorescent microscopy, but all of these are really incomplete ways to look at the structure, and this is one of the things we're trying to figure out. Um, so we and other groups are looking at the RepRap as this open source tool chain. We can harness the power of the community. We can contribute back to this community and figure out, can we reproduce? Can we 3D print structures that will help cells to grow and that will maybe mimic a lot of the structures we find in the body? So that's exactly what we did. So we modified a RepRap 3D printer. We used it to extrude sugar. And uh, sugar was a very interesting material for us to do because uh, sugar is a very biocompatible material. It's already in your bloodstream. Uh, but uh, it also has this very rigid property when you process it into a glass. And so this is sugar glass extruded off of a RepRap, and we can use that to make gels containing living cells to keep cells alive. So if we want to think about the structure from an engineering perspective of living tissue, well, we need to think about the different layers of tissue. So in the body, if you want to think about a simple single vessel, you're going to have the blood flowing. That's going to be where all the nutrients are coming from. Then you have these endothelial cells. These are cells lining all of the blood vessels at all scales in the body, and those prevent your blood from clotting. You have these smooth muscle cells around there. That's going to help to control your blood pressure. And then beyond that, you have these interstitial cells. These are things like liver cells, kidney cells. These are the organ type cells in the body. And so the punchline of our story was that we were able to make gels that could be, uh, we could flow blood through at very high flow rates, at arterial flow rates. So this is human blood. We can pump through these gels. And then we were able to put these endothelial cells and these other cell types in these types of architectures, all with the power of the open source movement. So we had such a good time interacting with the open source community. We were really asking the question, how could we formalize this interaction? How could we teach other scientists how to interact with the maker movement? How could we introduce science to the maker community? So a lot of people said initially, oh, makers, they're not really that serious. They couldn't really do this hard science. But uh, we knew that that wasn't true because people were just doing it as a hobby. If we just have a little bit more structure, we could show them how to do science and they would have significant contributions. So that's what we set out to do. So to formalize this interaction, we weren't really talking about decoration for formalization. We were thinking about structure. What we really wanted to do is have a conceptual framework. Maybe there's a way we can crystallize the experience that we had working in science, working with the maker community, and make it in a way that we could introduce other people to that. So that's how we came up with the uh, AMRI, the Advanced Manufacturing Research Institute, where the idea was by sharing knowledge and sharing information, we could unify the maker community, the DIY bio community. Some of you may have heard of DIY bio, do-it-yourself biology. This is the same type of idea of hobbyists that are, instead of doing 3D printing, maybe they're going to do something like looking at how bacteria grow and how cells function. And uh, so if we could unify these three groups, that was the idea, and these three groups are going to be working towards an AMRI fellow. So we were going to bring fellows into the science lab over the summer as a summer fellowship program. And they would have significant amounts of funding for mentorship, for sponsorship, amazing hardware, amazing tools available to them. And uh, what they did last summer, um, if you think about a lot of the stuff that you're seeing outside here in this room, uh, it's 
not just about uh, reinventing stuff. We're really thinking about what could we do to change things that are really advanced technologies right now. So things like projectors, things like inkjet cartridges, syringes and lasers, those are actually quite advanced technologies. If we think back all the way to those Leonardo da Vinci drawings, 500 years of progress, we have these advanced technologies, but a lot of them have become closed source. So what we were trying to do is not to reinvent some of these technologies, but to repurpose them and adapt them. And so what uh, our fellows did over the summer, we gave them an engineering design challenge for the first phase of this, where they were going to try to structure an idea of something they wanted to build, and then try to characterize it, and then try to quantify, measure things with it, and then document how they could do that. And then once they had that done, then we were going to look towards applying the scientific method. We also, um, I think a lot of people in the maker community haven't had a lot of training in things like biology and bioengineering. So we had them have a lab safety training course so that they wouldn't injure themselves um, maybe or other people in the lab. Um, and then they also took a crash course in advances in tissue engineering. So we wanted to make sure that they weren't just the people building things in the lab. They actually understood what, they, what science needed them to build and why. And we had some great uh, sponsors that you can see here. Um, so CMECNC again was an amazing partner here. Uh, also Ulta Machine and uh, the other groups here. So um, we also have two of the fellows here from the summer that are here right now, so they'll tell you about their projects. So uh, our first fellow is uh, Andy Ta. So at the time, he was working in the digital fabrication studio at uh, Maryland Institute College of Art. Um, the punchline is that his fellowship was very successful. He's now come back to the lab to be our lab manager. But um, he'll tell you about uh, his project in uh, DLP photolithography. All right, so my project during AMRI was uh, looking at DLP uh, SLA 3D printing. Uh, I don't know if some of you attended Josh's talk. Uh, it was pretty much using uh, photocurable resin to create uh, 3D structures. So before we start with that, I just want to talk about you know, my background and where I'm coming from. So as you just saw, my background is actually in economics and finance. There's absolutely no background in 3D printing, bio, or anything. Um, ultimately, my first introduction uh, to 3D printing came during a duration of unemployment. And I kind of came across this article about this kit that would allow you to make things. So that was my first introduction. I was like, hey, I'm going to buy one of these kits. I'm going to figure it out. As we all know, those of us that are former cupcake owners, that was a terrible, terrible machine. But it was the gateway. When you find these problems, this is an open source product from a formerly open source company. There was a community behind it. So together, I started reaching out, trying to figure out ways to improve it. And that led me to start leading build workshops. That's how I got to know a lot of the people uh, in this community. Together, we came together. We organized workshops and taught people how to build their own. We actually organized the very first uh, build workshops in the state side. From there, I started looking to other different techniques of how things are made. And ultimately, it led me to different jobs in uh, managing facilities for digital fabrication. So I would have access to machines like CNC routers, laser cutters. And it just allowed me to really explore methods of making things. And I just got really into designing machines and just making things. So from there, um, my interest started focusing on uh, moving away from FDM-based uh, printing and filament. So uh, the first pr uh, the project I started looking at was the DLP. So what's happening in this uh, video here is that there's actually a projector underneath. And it's projecting an image into the liquid. Uh, and that liquid is then being hardened into uh, a structure um, and slowly rising out of the reservoir. So for the DLP, there's three core components to uh, the mechanisms that make that whole system work. You have your materials, which is the UV resin, and in this case, it is maker juice. Uh, we have the light source itself and the mechanics that allow you to do your uh, building of layers. So for the light, you can see the video here. It's a projector projecting an image, and each image it's projecting is a complete layer. So this process, you can print very, very fast and very high resolution. So what we did is we just took an off-the-shelf projector and made a simple modification just so that we could have more UV content come through. And you can see the various uh, different patternings that we can do. So basic grid structures, the pattern you saw before, and then us controlling and projecting uh, images ourselves. 
So the light as a specific properties, we're using a UV killable a liquid, so therefore you need to kind of quantify the output that you're getting from various uh, light sources. So you can see different colors generates different uh, wattage, and that's what really is causing the reaction in the material. To further study it more, we got access to a lot of very high-end equipment to really understand the properties of the materials we're working with. So this machine right here is a, a rheometer. And what it's actually doing is it's compressing the liquid and exposing it to uh, the UV light source and then measuring the forces that are generated when it goes from a liquid to a gel state. So that's how you get the properties um, and understand what you should be exposing your image at and different times and different rates that it would work at. So from the machine itself, um, I chose to use aluminum extrusions by Masumi. I wanted something that I can easily modify, easily purchasable, and just really adaptable uh, to anything I would think of in the future. So you can kind of see the overall machine here. So pretty quick assembly, uh, brackets, aluminum extrusions I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. So from the individual frame components, you can kind of see like the overall structure. We have the bare components by themselves, the z-axis or the mechanism that would create your layering process, uh, and then the reservoir and your build platform. Uh, so here it is putting everything together. You can see that we're projecting a pattern and essentially the, z, uh, the build platform is rising, but you can imagine each layer being projected and then slowly rising out of that uh, reservoir of liquid. So what does all this have to do with bio? We've been working a lot with um, you know, commercially available resins and that's uh, definitely not a biocompatible material at all. You know, it's known to be a skin irritant. What we want to do is adapt uh, what we know and, um, and the many functions of the DLP and swap it with materials that are biocompatible. So the hope was that we would use a different material that we could then seed cells with and then build structures with that that the cells can then mimic and thrive within. So you can see multiple samples here. And the whole idea is that, you know, we're working from using commercial resin, moving over to a biocompatible material, uh, then starting to create structures and patterns that we are in control of. So in the beginning, it was just me manually shining a light into the liquid, and then me generating a pattern, and then increasing the complexity, and then eventually switching over to a full 3D structure. So the thing about Amory is that it's you know a, a test. Like, can makers actually do real science given the right infrastructure? And I mean, I would like to think so to the point where I now have a job doing just that. And the big thing is that we got to have access to resources that are just otherwise unavailable. And it's amazing what was given to us during the time at Amory. And I think it's just an example of that there's a relationship that needs to be fostered between scientists and makers and that together, if we kind of turn our attention away from you know, printing static objects like Yoda heads and iPhone cases and start looking towards uh, real world problems, we can actually figure out a lot of different solutions. And ultimately, the, you can follow the progress of that project at open3dlpblogspot.com uh, and uh, email me if you have any questions. So we'll, we'll just go to uh, one more presentation and then we'll take uh, more questions at the end for the whole group. So uh, next up we had uh, Steve Kelly. So Steve, um, he's an undergrad at um, WPI and uh, in math and he had, didn't know much bio at the time and he'll tell you about his experience at Amory. Uh, so my project was on inkjet printing and particularly we wanted to understand how to inkjet print bacteria. Um, so we kind of broke that down into three aspects which uh, we need to study, which were bacteria, mechanics, and patterning. And uh, we figured that if we could understand all three things, um, we'd be able to achieve our goal. So we came up with a proposal and that was to construct, analyze, and curate an inkjet printing system for printing multiple types of bacteria simultaneous, uh, sorry, simultaneously, accurately, and precisely. So you notice like the last part of that is more or less science and the first part of that is kind of like making and engineering. Um, so we, 
that was our kind of like convergence of making. So really what we're trying to do is um, take science as theory and theory uh, and apply that to engineering. So one of the first things we needed to understand was how inkjet heads worked. And so we were using thermal inkjet heads and what we wanted to understand was whether the bacteria would survive inkjet printing. Um, so it turns out some are, uh, some inkjet heads are a little bit too small for the bacteria to, to survive, but we found that um, on certain uh, low DPI, uh, that's the dots per inch, um, inkjet heads, the bacteria could fit through. And even more so, uh, since they're thermal, they're generating, essentially it's vaporizing the, the ink really fast and it's pushing it out the nozzle. Um, and it turns out that the bacteria can survive it because it's a really uh, short exposure. Um, all right, so uh, next we kind of looked at the control algorithms. And um, so particularly what we, oh, we cut out a slide here. I forgot about that. Um, Okay, so um, there was a, a group, uh, was it DIY Bio or BioCurious, um, almost two years ago now, that did a, uh, did a project, uh, uh, 3D printing, or it wasn't 3D printing, it was, it was inkjet printing bacteria. And uh, what we saw was uh, that we wanted to do two colors. And what we were thinking about is what kind of science we could do if we could do two colors. And, uh, one thing we were thinking about is why can't we just use a regular 2D printer? Why can't we just put bacteria in there and use it? And uh, it turns out that regular 2D printers use this kind of overlap pattern. And that overlap pattern isn't too good to, uh, to, to do science with because most science with bacteria, you want discrete boundaries. So that was a problem we were trying to understand. So this kind of ruled out modifying an existing 2D printer. We needed to create our own control algorithms. Um, so then we had to look at uh, how bacteria are grown. We found out that, well, so they, they kind of expand. And uh, so thinking about that, we knew that we didn't have to create high density clusters of bacteria. They would, uh, over time, grow to fill, fill the space. Um, and that said, we wanted to study the accuracy. And we were thinking about um, some initial studies we could do. Um, and that was thinking of the, the ink should have had it like a spray can. Um, it kind of fans out as you get further. So we wanted to find an optimal height distance for printing bacteria. And this was the first kind of experiment we set up. And we needed uh, some equipment. So of course, we needed a 3D because we wanted to be able to change the heights. And we needed uh, some inkjet head. And it turns out uh, the community had already put this together with the ink shield and the wrap wrap. And uh, so the ink shield is based on the Arduino, and RepRap is also based on Arduino. So we had some nice uh, overlap there that we could add. Uh, we added inkjet control to uh, the RepRap firmware. And so using that, we did some first tests, and we printed these strips that were, uh, you see on the left, that's the uh, printed pieces, uh, the dots. And we were able to use some OpenCV code and uh, figure out quantify what the accuracy was and, and what the, the, uh, the precision uh, for each uh, drop was. And that was pretty useful. So that's all uh, open data we have in a GitHub repository. And then looking at the path creation, we also used uh, some Python. And we created bitmap images and broke that down into G-code. And you can see that we had a, a black, uh, black ink head and a green ink, and we were able to do two colors. Um, so this was like pretty much proof of concept, uh, just to show we could calibrate things, get it all lined up, and it was pretty good. Um, then we wanted to look, do some surface experiments. So we tried uh, different ways to print uh, the bacteria. So one was printing directly onto the, the food it grows on. Uh, it's called agar. and. And then we want, we're also experimenting with printing onto paper and then transferring the bacteria onto the agar. Um, so yeah, that was another experiment we did. Um, that was uh, the the bulk of the stuff is on GitHub, and uh, you can also email me there. Um, but I just want to finish with some things about Amory. 
And I think this quote kind of sums it up. And it says, in science, if you know what you're doing, you should not be doing it. In engineering, if you do not know what you're doing, you should not be doing it. Of course, you seldom, if ever, see either pure state. Um, and I think that's interesting because um, Emory kind of takes makers that otherwise would just be kind of like driving it in one direction towards a vision and uh, a vision of a completed product. In science, science is never done, right? And uh, so, so to take engineering, you can kind of like refine that uh, what science is and, and the tools of science. So that was a uh, one picture of our, our setup. So Joe, I'll finish up. OK, we'll be happy to take any questions. Do you guys want to come back up? <laughs> Steve, want to come back up? Um, are there any uh, questions? Okay, um, I'm having trouble getting this out, sorry, but it, instead of printing in layers using the light reactive polymers, have you thought of using a holographic image projected into the material using lasers instead of just going, you know, micrometers at a time in layers and layers and layers? So you're thinking about like what they use for laser light shows and just drawing that straight into a, uh, a liquid? That's definitely yeah, I mean, I've definitely seen holographic images in great detail within mm -hmm. confined spaces, not just like a light show. I know the technology is out there, and I just wondered, had that yeah, ever? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely another application. It's just uh, this, the DLP is just the low-hanging fruit. When you start doing like higher complexity or projecting an image like that, it's Definitely a lot more things get involved, but the DLP is you just get a projector, you know. But uh, that's definitely some uh, future potential to look into. Okay, I mean, because right now you are actually projecting an image, right? But on to a limited layer. Exactly. Right. Right. All the action is only happening at the bottom of that reservoir. So the the platform sits and creates that very thin layer, and that's the only like little bit of the liquid that's hardening. But there should there may be some capabilities in doing what you're saying. Uh, yeah, just to add to that, I think it's a really interesting idea. Um, one of the things that we think about for patterning is we want discrete resolution. So the highest resolution you can get is when you have high signal to noise between the light intensity and the dark areas. And so I think for, um, I don't really understand much about holography, but I believe it's still shining light that's maybe more diffuse and it focuses to a single point inside the structure. So if you think about very complicated structures you might want to make, um, you might get polymerization or cross-linking of the gel outside of the area you want to pattern. Um, but I think there's things like multi-photon absorption where you can do very long wavelength light that is focused to a very small point that you get much greater um, polymerization only at the focal point. But those are about, those are like million dollar systems. So we're not yeah. starting there right now. We started with a $500 rep wrap and yeah. we're getting up to that. But you know, yeah. we need some more funding for that. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. No, absolutely. I think one of the big things is just that, you know, we're doing all this with 3D printing, but you know, 3D printing allows you to create very complex objects. And I think given that complexity is free in terms of 3D printing, what's the most complex things you can make in the world right now? That's human vasculature. Yeah, there, there's, this is like the killer app for 3D printing. And there's definitely a lot of methods to be explored. Yeah, and I guess I would just emphasize too, it's another thing to think about um, when you're seeing all the things being printed today in different ways and different chemistries is we don't know what the best structure is that we should print. So right now we're just trying to figure out what is something we can print that will let us test if that's a good thing to print. And when you're doing the living tissue, it can be very complicated. So um, as I was mentioning before, we don't even know the total structure of the anatomy found in the body. So we don't even fully know what we're trying to approximate. Um, and this is kind of the state of science and engineering right now. So we're starting with very simple structures that will give us a very simple yes or no answer. And then we're hoping that if we can get one vessel 
and one cell type, that will let us build up into much more complicated architectures because the technology is inherently so scalable and reproducible. Okay, thank you.